Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. I pray you've had a great week with Jesus. And I don't know if you've uh, heard, I'm, I'm assuming you all have heard, that Governor uh, Roy Cooper has extended phase two for three more weeks. <clears throat> so um, in light of that, I just want to encourage us to uh, practice the safety guidelines as we're out and about. Uh, as we're with other people, and that we are uh, being cautious not only for ourselves, but also um, demonstrating that to other people. You know, uh, this is the time when I'm thinking of two principles that the Bible talks about. Matthew 22, first principle is to love God with all our hearts, and the second principle is to love our neighbor as ourselves. So may the Lord continue to bless us, and he has blessed us tremendously. I'm not aware of anyone in our church family, families, who have contacted COVID, and we just want to praise the Lord and continue to pray uh, for ourselves and for others, especially those who have been inflicted with this virus. So thank you for tuning in today. We're going to open on the word of God. But before we do, I always like to uh, pray and ask the Lord's blessing and guidance. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we can share together on this, your holy Sabbath day. And Lord, we are seeking the guidance of your spirit as we open up your holy word this morning Praying, Father, that as your spirit leads and guide us, that we would listen to your still small voice speaking to our minds and our hearts. And thank you for that special blessing for each one of us. We continue to lift up our church families. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your divine providence over each one. And Lord, we also want to just ask that you would extend that blessing upon each of our family members. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our communities that we are part of. Asking, Father, that you would open doors of opportunity for each one of us to share the love of Jesus Christ and the truth about his soon return. So, Father, thank you for blessing us now as we open up your holy word because we ask and pray in the precious name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, church families, I am a history buff, and uh, a couple months ago, I discovered a documentary series on World War II, and uh, what drew my attention to this documentary series, I think there's 12, oh, 10 or 12 episodes in this series, but part of the advertisement was is that there was a film <clears throat> being shown that had never been shown on television before. And so that attracted my attention. And as I have watched all 10 or 12 episodes, uh, each episode was specific to World War II. And it covered the battles of the United States in Europe in the battles of the United States in the Southern Pacific uh, with Japan. And you know, as I was thinking about that this week, my experience of watching these documentaries on World War II and thinking about the horrors of war. You know, as an Air Force chaplain, I've had the privilege of sitting with veterans of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan. I have never been in a war situation, but through the eyes of these men and women that I've had the privilege to sit with and talk to and listen to their experiences, war is unbelievable. War is terrible. War is sad. And as I have thought, about my experience of sitting with all these veterans, as I have thought about my experience of listening to this, this documentary about World War II. 
even though these things that I've listened to and I've watched, even though I have been educated about many of the great battles of World War II, to me, there are two <clears throat> greater battles that have been fought on planet Earth that exceed, well, maybe I shouldn't say that, but can't compare <clears throat> to the battles of World War II in the wars in my lifetime. And the reason I say that is because to me, I'm thinking about the two greatest battles that have ever taken place on planet Earth. And both of these battles took place in a garden. One was the Garden of Eden, the other was the Garden of Gethsemane. And we know that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus chose to obey God. And just as Adam's decision in the Garden of Eden affected all of us, and I'm turning my, Bibles to, my Bible to Romans chapter 5, and I want to read to you verse 16. Romans chapter 5, verse 16. Listen to what the Bible says. Romans 5, verse 16. Well, verse 14, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam who, would, who a type of him who was to come. So, what have we inherited as, as descendants of Adam? We've inherited what? Death. We've inherited death. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ's decision affects all of us who believe in him by faith. I want to read to you in Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. This morning, I begin a new series and what I've done is I've taken the book Steps to Christ and this series will be a, a preaching series on the themes of the chapters in Steps to Christ. And then following finishing the sermon uh, sermons through the book Steps to Christ, I'll focus on the chapters in the book entitled The Sanctified Life. So this morning, we're gonna look at Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're gonna look at two things. We're gonna look at the events, the, the events of Gethsemane, and we're gonna talk about the impact of Gethsemane. So I invite you to take your Bibles, if you have them, and turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And in Romans chapter 14, I invite you to follow along as I begin reading with verse 32. Mark, not Romans, but Mark 14, 
beginning with verse 32. And the Bible says, Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what your will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Is it enough? The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Is at hand. Reading through verse 40. 42. Matthew, beginning with verse 32 through 42. So let's take a look at the events of Gethsemane. First, we need to take a look at the background. What was happening before Jesus' experience in Gethsemane? Think about this. The disciples had just partaken of the Passover supper. This would be Jesus's last meal with his disciples. I'm turning to Matthew, Mar, excuse me, Mark verse 14. I want to begin reading verse 22. Mark 14, beginning with verse 22. And as they were easy, eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take ye, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Little did the disciples realize that at this time, the implications of breaking bread and drinking the juice and following this, they sang a song and they went to Mount Olives. On their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now let's look at the context of the verses we read in Mark 14, beginning with verse 32. You see, as they draw near to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus gives instructions to his disciples. Think about this. He left eight at the entrance of the garden. I want to read to you verse 32 of Mark 14. And then, then they came to the place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, what did he say to them? Sit here, sit here while I pray. And then the Bible says he took Peter and James and John a little farther into the garden. Now, when Jesus told his disciples to sit, it did not mean to sit and do nothing. 
I want to take your thoughts now, if you hold your finger there in Mark 14, I want to take your thoughts to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I want to read to you verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Hmm. So, so Jesus gave him instructions to sit. And he later gives instructions to Peter, James, and John to sit and pray. And when Jesus instructs us from the scriptures about something that he desires for us to do, hopefully we're going to respond to what he asks us to do. Jesus asked the disciples to watch and to pray. They were to be watching. They were to be praying. Now, I went to the Greek lexicon and looked up the word watch. What does watch mean in the Greek? It means to be alert. It means to be vigilant. So think about this. Each time that the Lord came to check on his disciples, he found them asleep. And I'm going back to Mark chapter 14, and I want to read to you verse 37. Then he came out, found them sleeping, and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? And then the Bible says, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. That's verse 39. And then verse 41 of Mark 14 says, Then he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Is it enough? The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now, brothers and sisters, I'd like to suggest something. That in this experience, Jesus is not only talking to his disciples then, but he's talking to me. He's talking to all of us as followers of Christ. And he is encouraging us to watch and pray, and I may add these words to be ready. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to read to you verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Paul writes these words to the church members in the Thessalonica church and yet he's sharing these words to me today maybe he's sharing these words to you today first Thessalonians 5 verse 6 therefore let us not sleep as others do but let us watch and be sober let us watch and be sober To watch, to be alert, to what is going around us spiritually. You know, in prayer meeting this past week, I'm not sure if it was Tuesday or Wednesday night, I made this comment. I'm so thankful. I am blessed to know what I know about the Word of God. Because in, the, in, in my personal awareness of what's happening in our world, and I look through what's, and I look at the world through spiritual eyes, through spiritual understanding. What Sister White talks about in her book, Last Day Events, is happening before our very eyes. 
We are to be spiritually alert with every new day of life. You know, when I was younger, I was visiting some friends. This was before I went in the Air Force. I was visiting some friends who lived about an hour and a half from where I lived. And we got together and we were boating and swimming and having a cookout and having a good old time. And, and I had to leave and I left later than I intended. And uh, I was driving home and I got really sleepy. Now I've never, I don't know if you've ever experienced what it's like to fall asleep at the wheel. But this particular night, I fell asleep at the wheel. And when I woke up, I was headed for some guardrails. And that shook me to the core. So I pulled over, I rolled down all the windows, I turned up the music, the radio station, and I drove home very, uh, not slowly, but slower than what I was going. And I did that to help myself stay awake. And brothers and sisters, today, we need to be awake spiritually. What are some of the things we need to be alert about? Well, I want to share some Bible texts. The first text is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Listen to what the Bible says. Least Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I want to take your thoughts now to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 the Bible says be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion lion seeking whom he may devour. And then I want to turn to Revelation chapter 12 and I want to share with you verse 9. Revelation 12 verse 9. So the great red dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Brothers and sisters, I need to be spiritually alert today. You need to be spiritually alert today. We need to be spiritually alert today. And I go back to the disciples who were with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It seems to me that the disciples had become comfortable. They were not alert. They were not watching. They were not praying. And as I was thinking about that this week, one of my thoughts went to Revelation chapter 3. We're living in the time of the church of Laodicea. And I want to read to you verses 15 through 17 of Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 15. Jesus says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know 
that I am, you are, we are, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And the only way that we can overcome that is what? Focusing on Jesus, feeding our mind with his word, praying for his guidance, and sharing our experiences with others. You know, I praise the Lord for our Sabbath school lessons, especially for today. Well, the past two have been good too, but seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. Think about this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked his disciples to pray for him. Especially after what he had just told them. And what did he just tell them? Well, I'm taking you back to Mark chapter 14. I'm going to read to you verse 27. Verse 27 of Mark 14 says this. Mark 14, verse 27. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And I'm going to read verse 34. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. And the reality is, they were not watching and they were not praying. They were not watching and praying for Jesus and they were not watching and they were not praying for themselves. Little did they realize that a time of testing was just ahead of them. Why do I say that? Because I take your thoughts now to verse 38 of Mark 14. Watch and pray, lest you enter in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And if you look at verse 50 of Mark 14, you see that when they came to take Jesus, what happened to the disciples? Verse 50 says, then they all forsook him and did what? They fled. Praise the Lord. When the guards, Jesus tried, praise the Lord that Jesus tried to warn his disciples that there was a time of testing that was just ahead of them. And when the guards came to take Jesus away, verse 50 says, all the disciples fled. Now, I want to take a moment and I want to take a moment to talk about the importance of prayer. I want to use four figurative phrases. Take off your shoes, go into your closet, open the window, and fold your hands. Now, these phrases emerge from the first phrase, which is, take off your shoes, is in Exodus chapter 3. Remember? When God passed by Moses, what did, what did God say to Moses? He said, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says to go into your closet to pray. Now, I'm not talking about a literal closet. Some people do that. But to me, that means to have a special place and time to meet with God. And then to open the window in, he, in Hebrews chapter 4, God already knows what we're thinking and how we're feeling. And open the window means to be honest with God. And then finally, in Psalm 46, verse 10, the Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. And what that says to me is that after we're done praying, we take time to listen to the Spirit of God talking to our minds and our hearts. So now I want to focus our attention on Jesus' prayer to our Heavenly Father. 
I want to take your attention back to Mark chapter 14, and I want to read to you verse 35 and 36. Mark 14, verse 35 and 36. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. The Bible says that Jesus fell on the ground. And to me, he felt that because, because of sin, he was being separated from his father. This separation was so bleak, so deep, so dark, that he shuddered. And he feared that in his human will, he would be unable to endure the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. Think about this, brothers and sisters. In the wilderness, after Jesus was baptized and having been in the wilderness 40 days, Jesus conquered Satan. But now, Satan was coming for the last final struggle. Everything was on the line. Everything. So why did Jesus pray that this cup might pass from him? And to me, the cup represents the sins of the world. And what does sin do? It separates us from God. Jesus knew that in a short time, he would be taken upon himself the sins of the world. And at that time, God would turn his back on Jesus. Remember the words of Jesus on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I want to read a thought found on page 678 in Desire of Ages. My favorite Christian author writes these words. Behold Jesus contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul. In his agony, he clings to the cold ground as if to present him, prevent himself from bring, being drawn farther from God. The chilling dew of the night falls upon his prostrate form, but he heeds it not. From his pale lips come the bitter cry, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet even now he adds, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In the supreme agony of his soul, he then comes to his disciples. And what does he find them? He finds them asleep. When Jesus took our sin upon himself, God had no choice but to forsake him. Sin separates us from God. And to me, Jesus experienced the eternal separation from God for you and me. Praise the Lord for what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 22, it says that he sweat great drops of blood. The agony but praise the Lord, he followed through and did God's will 
and not his own. So let's take a look at the impact of the Garden of Gethsemane. It was here that Jesus surrendered to the cross. I'm going back to Mark 14. I want to read to you the last part of verse 36. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And to me, <clears throat> this is a statement of complete submission. He surrendered to the will of his Father. It meant that he would suffer. It meant that he would bear the shame of the cross. I want to turn to the book of Isaiah and I want to read a couple verses. Of what was happening in Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53. <clears throat> I begin reading verses 5 through 8. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison from judgment. And he will declare his generation. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. I want to add something that Paul has written. I'm turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to read to you verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, the Bible says... For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Think about this, brothers and sisters. Jesus took upon himself the guilt of every lie, every theft, every murder. Every sin that any human being has ever committed. And he began to sense in the depth of his inmost being the separation that sin will ultimately make between God and lost sinners. Yes, he experienced the second death. Three times. The Son of God was pressed. The Son of God was pressed. To do the will of his Father. Or between his own eternal life. And ours. Reading verse 38 of Mark 14. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus was struggling with his humanity, fearing. Fearing that he wouldn't be able to endure. But think about this. In Gethsemane, 
Jesus made the decision to save us at any cost to himself. The Bible implies, as we think about his experience, that if the angel had not appeared to strengthen him, to me it seems he would have died in the garden before reaching the cross. What an expression of love. What an expression of love. Jesus Christ is the expression of love. And that's what God's character is. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I want to read to you these verses. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love is the principle that gives purpose to every other attribute of God. It is the motivation of his selflessness In every deed, he reveals his love. And his love is the only influence through which we as human beings are able to experience the truest reality of God's presence in our lives. 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love. And love is the number one attribute of God's character. You know, I, I got on the internet and was looking for <clears throat> a hymn that was, the author uh, was influenced by him reading the word of God and specifically what happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there's a gentleman that I learned, he wrote a hymn, it's called 10,000 Angels. It was written by Roy Overholt in 1958 at the height of his show business career. He wanted to write a, 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 a Christian song. He talks about remembering his mother reading the Bible to him. He knew very little about the Bible, but one day he opened it and he began to read it and he, his attention focused on Jesus' ex experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he wrote precious words about Jesus telling Peter to put away his sword because God could have sent thousands of angels. He was so impacted by this that he quit his, his career, started singing and playing in little churches. And a little time after that, he was in a little church he performed special music about his new song that he had written. And then that day, as the preacher was preaching from the word of God, the Holy Spirit gripped his heart. And then in the quietness of his heart in this little church, he invited Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of his life. Here's one stanza of the, the 
the hymn that he wrote. He could have called 10,000 angels to set us free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Today we talked about two things about Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. We talked about the events that took place in the Garden. We talked about Jesus' disciples and he encouraged them to watch and pray and not get comfortable. We looked at Jesus' prayer to his Father. Jesus prayed that the Father might let this cup pass from him. But remember his words, not my will, but your will be done. You know, sometimes I get on the YouTube and they have these guided tours about where places where Jesus have, has been and the places he visited in his ministry. I don't know if I ever get the opportunity to go and visit some of these places personally, but it certainly is interesting to walk, to observe these virtual tours following the footsteps of Jesus. And, you know, we can go and whether we go there personally or on tour virtually, we can go to the garden. But brothers and sisters, the garden of Gethsemane has little significance unless, unless we've invited Jesus to our hearts and follow him. And I'd like to add this thought in closing. The Garden of Gethsemane has little significance because it's not about a place. It's all about a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for a glimpse, hmm, a small glimpse of the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Lord, as we contemplate his experience there, may it influence us today choose to love you more than we did yesterday. And thank you for the gift of your son Jesus who died for the whole world, who died for you and me. That by believing in him by faith we can have the assurance of eternal life. Thank you for that blessing and promise to each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.